of Geo 67 day one, and this is our second to last new piece of material for the entire semester. Okay, anything else that's new just means that you didn't review very much <laughs> before the final, and it's like, wow, I've never seen this before. Yeah, we really need to make sure you do some cursory review. Uh, make sure you're rereading your notes. Make sure you're going over it on a daily basis. Matter of fact, each day I probably cover the material five to seven times, and I'm not the student. I'm just the person that's going through it, getting ready for it, and doing other stuff. But I find the more often I go over it, I recall it better. Wow, that's kind of a weird thing. If you did that on a presentation, think about if you go over a presentation, how many times you do it, okay? And you just slam it home, awesome job. Why aren't you doing that on every one of your class notes to improve your understanding of them so you can take care of getting it done for tests? You got to make sure you do that. Recursively go over your stuff. Practice the things you're having difficulty with. Make it smoother. Make it easier for you. If you have questions, ask. That's that's it in a nutshell. That's study. But people go, ah, oh, you know, I don't really want to. I just want to do really well without doing a darn thing. Well, that doesn't happen. That's called kindergarten, man. Okay, showing up and just getting it done. Hey, way to go, you finger painted the day. And you didn't get anything, well, you know, on that part of your face, right there. Okay, because you're completely covered from head to toe. But you had a ball. But make sure you recognize, the further we go on, the more we are expected to know. Okay, and in order to know that stuff, we got to do stuff to get it done. Okay, you can try not to, but that just makes you really frustrating frustrated with yourself and the people that work with you in groups because they're like, oh, no, I don't want to be with that person because they don't get things done. Do you want to be that person? You don't want to be the person that's just getting it done and moving on to the next thing. Make sure you're getting it done. So here it is. That's my soapbox thing for today. Um, our objective, classify figures in the coordinate plane using the formulas for slope, distance, and midpoint. We've seen these before. Matter of fact, distance and midpoint, we've seen since, since September. You've also done slope. You did slope as eighth graders. Okay. You did it as a ninth grader, maybe, depending on what they did in their uh, stats class. Okay. You might have seen it in Expo because you did systems of equations. They talked about how lines cross, and it's that point where the two lines come together. But you definitely saw it again in Geometry in Chapter 3, Section 7 and 8. So this is something that's coming back, and you're going to see it again next year. Matter of fact, the first three chapters of Algebra 2, complete review. Matter of fact, I keep telling folks, hey, you know all that Algebra 2 is really hard. And I have students strutting their stuff going, Bloom, you're so wrong. Algebra 2 is a breeze. And I was like, yeah, review is a breeze. 1, 2, and 3, no problem. It's right about halfway through Chapter 3. I start having students come out of the Algebra 2 classes, missioners and you know everybody else who teaches it. If you just stand there with a pitcher, they look like zombies because of the amount of new material they went through. And I just smile and went, yep, welcome to the day. Bloom, Bloom promise would be happening. <laughs> Make sure you study, okay, because it just takes off. And the stuff I do in my college class is just that Algebra 2 stuff and then more. Okay, so keep in mind, it's a lot of material, and if you don't recursively go over it every day, covering it, making sure you kind of review it, making sure it's clear in your head, it gets all muddled. So make sure you're taking care of that. Now, we're looking at uh, distance formula. Distance formula is used in this section to help us determine the lengths of sides and the lengths of diagonals. Okay, and people are, well, what's the purpose of that? Well, I'm determining the lengths of sides and lengths of diagonals. I can tell you that opposite sides are congruent. I can tell you that consecutive sides are congruent. I can tell you that diagonals are congruent or not. Okay, and people are like, well, what's good is that? Well, when opposite sides are congruent, I know it's a parallelogram. When consecutive sides are congruent, I know it is a rhombus. Okay. When I've got um, diagonals that are congruent, I know it's either a rectangle or a square. So those are things, are properties that are delivered back to me about the information that we're working on. So midpoint. Midpoint of itself, I'm going to talk about midpoint to determine the midpoint of a side. You know, it's really cool, but 
it's more about the midpoint of a diagonal. People are like, well, what about midpoints of diagonal? If I know that two diagonals have exactly the same midpoint, the information that's been delivered to me is as follows. First of all, I know that, and I know this. But more importantly, I know that those two diagonals have exactly the same midpoint, which means they're mutual bisectors of each other, okay? Necessary property of parallelogram, okay? So that needs to happen. And that's what I would use that for if I was just going to determine a four-sided figure. What was it? Now, so what's parallelogram because of that property? But then, you know, if I'm told it's parallelogram, maybe I get to do other things. Now, the other things I can determine if something's already a parallelogram is for slope. If I know the slope of consecutive sides, the slope of consecutive sides are opposite reciprocals. They're perpendicular. If they're perpendicular, their product of the two slopes is negative one. One of the two, you know, you know, opposite reciprocals, okay, of each other. Or if I take and multiply the two slopes together, their product is negative one. I can tell you that they're 90 degrees at that corner. And 90 degrees is significant because squares have corners that are 90 degrees. Rectangles have corners that are 90 degrees. Rectangles, no, excuse me, rhombuses and squares have diagonals that are perpendicular. So they're 90 degrees there too. So those are significant pieces of information to help me find things. So I got to know about diagonals, I got to know about sides, and I got to see if things are parallel. That's what I would use slope for. Okay. And remember, slope is rise over run. And it's just counting with a purpose. So we got to make sure we're comfortable with that. This little side note in blue here is talking about slope of the first line times the slope of the second line. If that equals negative 1, then the two lines are perpendicular. Okay? And we learned that in section uh, chapter 3, section 8. Excuse me. Okay, so let's get on with it. We got four example problems. And what we're looking at is triangle ABC has vertices 0, 1, 4, 4, and 7, 0. If triangle ABC is triangle ABC scalene, isosceles are equilateral. Let's go over the, what those mean. Scalene, no sides of the same measure. E isosceles, two sides of the same measure. Equilateral, three sides of the same measure. Let's talk about how I know based on angle value. If I have no angles that are congruent inside a triangle, then it's a scalene triangle. If I have two angles that are congruent inside a triangle, then it's an isosceles triangle. If I have three angles that are congruent inside a triangle, it's an equilateral triangle. Okay? So I am aware the connection of angles and sides inside a triangle. You should be too. Now, with that said, they're asking us to determine whether it's one or the other. We could use distance formula. We really could. It's there. It's possible. But... I'm asking you to graph this, and I'm going to show you a shortcut. It's the same shortcut I've been working on with you since, I, I think, September. Hey, I got a picture. Let's make little right triangles and just use the Pythagorean theorem. That's why I've got this up here. That's the Pythagorean theorem. Kind of like, you know, it's not a squared plus b squared equals c squared, but it's, it's really down and dirty to what I need you to know. The length C, the hypotenuse, is related to the two legs, A and B, squared and added together, and then I find their square root. So here's how I use it. If I'm looking for A, B, I just think about this triangle here. This is 3, this is 4. So I got a leg of 3, a leg of 4. 3 squared plus 4 squared. 9 plus 16 is 25, the square root of which is 5. Now, I can totally do that every time. And I always have students go, but Bloom, you said the distance formula. This is a distance formula thing. How do you use the distance formula with this? Well, I got 4 and 0. Those are my x values of a and b. I find their difference. And I got 4 and 1, and those are my y values, and I find their difference. After I find their difference, I still have 4 squared and 3 squared. And then I still find the answer is 5. It's just that if I already have the picture, it is so much faster. 
So if I'm going BC, if I go from B to C, hey, that's 3, 4. Crazy. But I go and put those in, and I also have that as 5. Crazy. Okay, so right now I know it's an isosceles triangle. I'm going to check the last one and see if it's equilateral. Okay, so I got two sides that are congruent. So I'm going to check the last one. It's down one. I'm going to get a different color here, black. Down one over seven. Holy cow. That's seven squared and one squared. Okay, it's 49 and one. That's 50. All right. But now remember Expo last year? Matter of fact, exactly a year ago from this week, you did a lot of like, hey, you know, we're going to factor, we're going to find the largest perfect square factor, and we're going to extract it from underneath the root. So we simplify that. 25 times 2, right? Square root of 25 is 5. We got 5 to the square root of 2. I know you may forget how to do that, but you did a full week or two of just that in Expo. Okay? <clears throat> now, based on our findings, Two sides are exactly the same. It's isosceles. Okay. Now, don't do all this supportive work and then forget to answer the question. And yes, on these, you should be showing how you know. It should be, well, it looks like. Okay. If you're finding out that you're saying it looks like, we're in trouble. That's the same score on your uh assignment question as if you were talking to mom and dad and said, well, everybody else is doing it. I want to do it too. And then they'd come up with that silly, well, if everybody else was jumping off a bridge, would you do it too? And don't be the person that says, well, you know, how deep's the water? Okay. And how far do I got to drop? I mean, Golden Gate, no, you die hitting probably. It would hurt. I wouldn't want to do that, but you know, and they're like, oh, go to your room. Okay. Come down when you're 90. Okay. All right. <laughs> Rip shoves over here going, yep, they exactly say that to me all the time. I can't believe it. I think you'd think I'd learn. No. <laughs> okay. So here's the deal. In problem two, same type of stuff. Okay. But remember, the whole thing driving what I do in each problem is connected to what they give me and what they're asking me to find and the tools I will use to find it. So here I got... I'm going to put in my triangle. So get that sucker down. Get that all put it in there. Are you texting your mom and dad saying you're sorry for your behavior last night? Okay, good. Okay, so triangle DEF has vertices D00, E14, and F52. Okay? Is triangle DEF scalene, isosceles, or equilateral? Gosh, it's the same thing. It is, and I really want you, want you, want you to use that Pythagorean theorem shortcut. You already got a picture. Get it done. Okay, see what's going on. Find DE, find EF, find DF. Make the determination which type of triangle it is. I have to find all three side lengths and able to determine it. So give it a try. So the first one, I'm looking at DE. I'm going to count up from D, 1, 2, 3, 4, over 1 to E. And that's 4, 1. So it's 4 squared plus 1 squared. Is there anybody that got a question on how I come up with that and why I'm doing it the way I'm doing it? Keep in mind, it's a shortcut. It's still the distance formula. I'm just not plugging in the points. I already graphed the points. I was very careful to graph the points. I didn't graph them so it was like questionable where the graph was located. I graphed them very precisely so that when I do this shortcut, it's easier and faster for me. Okay. It also gives me an idea when I'm graphing it, what approach I'm going to do. Because if it looks like a right triangle right away when I'm graphing, that's going to help me a couple times too because I don't have to do this square root. Because if I have like D and E on a vertical line, I just count the distance from D to E and that's the distance. If it's horizontal, I count the distance from D to E and that's the distance. The distance is still the same from when you were a kindergartner. People go, hey, well, how long is this line? And you count, you're able to count straight up it was horizontal or vertical. Do it. Don't put it in the formula. Okay, I mean, our first assignment question is like that today. 
But on this case, when I'm, I got a slanted segment, that's why I've got to use the distance formula. Okay, so I got four squared and one squared, it's squared is 17. Okay, when I'm done. And I'm not going to put that in a calculator. I know it's more than four because square root of 16 is four, square root of 25 is five. So it's, my answer should be between four and five. Okay, it's closer to four than it is to five. Right? So EF is my next one. I'm going to go over here and talk about EF. One, two, three, four, five. Four, one, two, three, four, down two. Well, right now, just my number sense is telling me these two aren't going to be the same. Because the first one had one squared, and this one has two squared. Okay, well, that's going to be more, right? Two is more than one, so this one should be more. And it ends up being the square root of 20. Now, do you remember finding that perfect square inside of 20 and then taking that out so you extract the root so you have 2 to the square root of 5 is your final answer? Yes, you should because that's what you did last year. That's coming down the pipe. That's what we're going to be doing in Chapter 8, second semester. I'm just kind of touching on it lightly today. Okay. Now, DF. DF, I'm going to go over there and get after that one. From D, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 1, 2. So I got 5, 2. Right now, what I know is not one of these stinking lengths is the same as any other. Gosh darn it. What's my answer now if none of the sides are the same? Scalene. That's the deal. All right. Cool. Are you okay with what I did and how I did it? Okay. Now, that's triangles in a nutshell. We've got two more examples. Okay. Both examples give you the fact that the figure we're working with is a parallelogram. That is significant amount of information. It's huge. They're telling you in the problem itself, when I'm going on to these next ones, that opposite sides are the same measure. Opposite sides are parallel. Opposite angles are the same measure. Consecutive angles are supplementary. And diagonals bisect each other. They tell me all that in that one shape, parallelogram or word. Okay, we got the little shape right before A, B, C, D. That's telling me it's a parallelogram and it has all those properties. Okay, they're asking me here, is A, B, C, D a rhombus? So not only does it have all the parallelogram properties, but they want to know, hey, are all the sides the same? If they are, it's a rhombus, okay? Or are the diagonals perpendicular? Because if they are, it's a rhombus, okay? A parallelogram with diagonals that are perpendicular is a rhombus, okay? Those are the two things I can check. So I could check slope and multiply them together and decide to do it that way. I'm not going to. I'm just going to do it this way. We know all the, pair, the pairs of opposite sides are parallel, right? What if... I had a consecutive pair, consecutive pair, meaning they share the same angle, okay? A consecutive pair of sides, not opposite, there's the next one, are the same measure. Because if the consecutive are the same measure, and I'm going to pick A and B, A, B, if this, although those are the same, and B, C, and A, D are the same, because it's a parallelogram, if I can show that a, B, and B, C of the same. If I can show that, then all of them are the same. Right now, I just know that. But I want to prove this maybe. Okay? And all I have to do is have B, C, and A, B, or B, C, and D, C, or D, C, and A, D, or A, D, and A, B be the same measure. There's four ways I could approach it this way. Once I know in a parallelogram consecutive sides are the same, then it's a rhombus, okay? But if they're not, then it's just a parallelogram. So let's check it. So I'm going to pick A, B, and I'm going to count 1, 2, 3, 4, 2. Hey, we did that, square root of 20, okay? Which is 2 to the square root of 5. We did that already, okay? B, C, that's 1 for, oh, man. Check it out. B, 1, 1, 2, 3, 4. Ah, you know, you thought it looked like it, right? 4 squared, 1 squared is just 17. It's not 20. So what I know right now with the information I've gathered from my problem is the fact that this is just a parallelogram. It's not a rhombus. 
Okay, so I write that. Consecutive sides are not equal, so A, B, C, D is not a rhombus. It's, it's a parallelogram. Okay. Are you okay with the method and the process I'm using to work these out? And although I decided to do consecutive sides here, I could have totally looked at the slope of AC and BD and seen if those slopes multiply together to be negative 1. And in this case, they wouldn't have because it's not a rhombus. So they wouldn't have been per perpendicular. Okay? Now, if it is a rhombus, or if it is a parallelogram, and they want to know if it's a rectangle, I have to find if consecutive sides that make an angle are perpendicular. Okay, because that's a right angle. That's 90 degrees. And if I know it's a parallelogram, all I have to do is prove it once. Okay, and people are like, how do you know it's just proven it once? Because if it's a parallelogram, and that's what they say here, it's a parallelogram. Is parallelogram NLP a rectangle? I'm going to use the fact that in order for something to be a rectangle, it's got to have four right angles. And if I know a parallelogram, a parallelogram has one right angle, by the properties of parallelograms, it has all four. And here's why. A parallelogram's opposite angles are congruent. So if I can show that angle N is 90 degrees, then automatically angle Q is because it's a parallelogram. And because it's a parallelogram and N and Q are 90 degrees, and consecutive angles in a parallelogram are supplementary, then angle M and P must also therefore be 90 degrees, and it's a square or rectangle. Okay, But first it's a rectangle. If it's a square, then I have to show that all the sides are the same. And we'll talk about that in a sec. Okay, so let's talk about slope. Rise over run, I'm, and by the way, what this means, my, my notation here, I'm looking at the slope, that's M, of my segment MN. And I'm looking at the slope, that's my other M, of my segment NP. So my slope of MN, if we go from M to N or N to M, it's actually down 3 over 1. So it's negative 3, 1. Okay, are you okay with how I found that? My slope of MN or NM is negative 3, 1. My slope of NP still rise over run, is 1 over 3. Now, <clears throat> negative 3 over 1 times 1 over 3 returns me negative 3 over 3, which is just negative 1. That's the check. If I have a con, a, if I'm able to multiply the product of the two slopes, multiply, product of the two slopes is negative 1, if I multiply them together and I get negative 1, they're perpendicular. And therefore, like I had talked about, once I have a parallelogram with one right angle, all four angles are right. Okay, because opposite angles are congruent and consecutives are supplementary. Okay, so that's part A for problem four. It's a rectangle. Now, they're being more particular about it. Well, is the parallelogram NNPQ a square? I already found that it was a rectangle, so it's got four right angles. What's the other necessity that I need for it to be a square? Sides the same size, or even the diagonals are perpendicular. I have that choice. I can do either one of those. I don't have to do them both. I can just do one. I'm just going to do one. I'm going to do the quickest one. I, at least I feel because I just showed you guys the shortcut for the uh, Pythagorean theorem. You need to check the length of two sides that are consecutive. And that's the same check we'd check on a parallelogram if it's a rhombus to see if it's a square if it's already got right angles. It's got right angles, so we're going to see if this rectangle is a rhombus by checking their consecutive sides. And I kind of got that written in there. So now, on this one, I'm going to look at it and go, oh, well, you know, the length from M to N is really a 3, 1. So that's a 3, 1. That's 9 plus 1. It's the square root of 10. And the length from N to P, well, that's a three. Ooh, that's a 1 and 3. That's the same. I'm pumped because now I get to look at this thing and come up with my conclusion. So MNPQ is a square. And all I'm doing is taking knowledge and synthesizing it for an application to show how I know given 
figures in the coordinate grid are certain types of figures, whether it's be a what type of triangle, scalene, isosceles, equilateral, or what type of parallelogram, a regular parallelogram, a square, a rhombus, or a rectangle. Okay, so I can take those properties and apply them and be able to determine what they are based on the properties of those figures themselves. Okay or I should say I can take those equations and do that. So make sure you recognize that that's what we're doing in today's assignment. Now, I'm going to give you the assignment in a little bit, but before we get there, let's correct yesterday's assignment. And yesterday's assignment was 7 through 9, 16 through 32 of the 6-6 six, six day, because it was day 2, and this is what we got. And we're talking about these. So in 7, I'm talking about the measure of angle 1, is equal to the measure of angle 2, which is 108 degrees. And some people are like, how in the world did you know that? And it really comes down with the fact that this is a four-sided figure and enable for me to determine the total interior angle value if I didn't just memorize that every four-sided figure has 360-degree internal interior angle value, that I can go, hey, the number of sides, 4, pop that in to n, 4 times minus 2 is 2, 2 times 180 is 360, and I found out 360. Then I took 360, the total interior angle value of a four-sided figure, and I added 54 and 90. And people are like, why are you doing that? I already know those. I'm going to subtract those off to find the rest, and that's 144. So that's 216 left. Now, I've got to talk about the fact that we discussed yesterday that the long axis of a kite is the symmetry line. And the short axis, those angles, 1 and 2, they're actually equal to each other. So that's why I took 216 and divided it by 2. And that's where 108 came from. 216 divided by 2, it's right there. Okay. So those are the properties I applied to get this done. Now, in 8... I know it's a kite because it's marked. This is my long axis. My long axis splits the two consecutive sides that are congruent. Okay, so I know that this is 40. I know that this is 90, so 1 and 3 are 90. I know 2 is the acute angle with 40 that make 90 in a right triangle, so 2 has to be 50. The measure of angle 2 is 50 degrees. The measure of angle 1 is, and 3 are equal. Excuse me. So those are 90 degrees as well. Now, keeping this in mind, 9 looks like it's the hardest thing on the face of the planet, right? But you got to look at it. Angle 1, 2, 3, and 4 are all 90 degrees. So that knocks 4 right off the bat. Angle 6 is a mirror image of the one up the top because that's the, the symmetry line. So angle 6 is 34. Angle 5 is 46. Okay, do you see those? Now, because of that, the two acute angles in a right triangle, and I'm referring to this right triangle right here, make 90 degrees. So 90 minus 34 is 56. So angle 9 and angle 7 are both 56. And then angle 5 is 46. So angle 8 and angle 10 are both 44. And that's the angle value for all those in 9. Are there any follow-up questions with those three? Doing okay? Okay. Now, sliding on to that next set, we're looking at 16. 16 and 17, and the reason why I'm working these is that everybody had questions on these five. Okay? Now, I need you to be aware that I will give you information to make it look incredibly nasty, horribly hard. Okay? Right? This one looks nasty. It really does. But if it really gets down to one thing, ignore that. Okay, don't worry, we'll come back to it. We didn't kill it, we just covered it. I want you to look at this right triangle. People are, how do you know it's a right triangle? Because it's a kite and that's a right angle. Now, keep in mind, this is a right triangle. The two acute angles in a right triangle sum to 90 degrees. X plus 6 plus 2X equal 90. 3X plus 6 equal 90. Subtract 6, 3X is equal to uh, 84, which is 28. Okay, you okay with that? Now, keeping that in mind, again, I have symmetry line. And these two angles, this one and this one, are the same. So 3x plus 5 is equal to 4x minus 30, and x is 35. 
this is 110, so is this after I plug those values in. Okay? Now, now that I got that as 110, is there any questions about how I got it to 110? Y and 2Y minus 20 will add, because of triangle sum theorem, to 180. But they only have to make 70 of it because this is 110 of it. So Y plus 2Y minus 20 is equal to 70. Now I got 3Y equal 90 and Y equals 30. And we're done with that. Okay? In eight, all squares are rectangles. This is true all the time because squares have right angles. Okay. Nineteen, a trapezoid is a parallelogram. It can't be. Parallelograms, both sets of opposite sides are parallel. A trapezoid only has one. Okay. A rhombus can be a kite. It can be. Okay, because the requirements being a kite is that I have perpendicular diagonals and consecutive sides being the same. And the rhombus, the consecutive sides are the same. It's just that they're all the same. Okay? So it's the best name is to be a rhombus. Okay? Uh, 21. Some parallelograms are squares. Some parallelograms are squares. The ones that have all the sides the same and right angles. So yeah, that's true. Okay? Every quadrilateral is a parallelogram. Now they're saying every four-sided figure has opposite sides being parallel. If that were true, we would not have trapezoids. So that's false. 23, all rhombuses are squares. No, because that would mean all rhombuses have right angles. That's not true. All squares, however, are rhombuses, because all we have to do is have all the sides the same, and that's true. Okay. Now, in 24, x is 61, and 25 x is 27, and 26, uh, what is that, x is 1, what is that, no, I lied, 26, these are, these will sum together, could be 90, 6x plus 18 is equal to 90, so that's 72, so x is 12, okay, um, and 27, what is it, uh, c is 89, Okay, as I work that information out, are we okay with those? Are there any questions? I have some head bobbles. We're doing okay. Are we okay with the total exterior angle value of polygons is 360, so C plus C plus 28 plus C plus 65 is equal to 360, and I solve that. And 28, the midpoint in length, the length is like 14.14, okay. It's uh, 2 to the square root of 10, or 2 to the square root of 100, excuse me. And then um, the midpoint is 1, uh, 3 on 28. In 29, find the line, the slope of the line containing those points. And slope, again, remember, slope, as we pop those in, negative 1 fourth, okay. Uh, which statement's never true? Trapezoid is never a parallelogram. Okay, a quadrilateral has four congruent sides, which best uh, describes the figure. Okay, four congruent sides. I don't know anything else, so it's a rhombus. How would you classify each, well, classify triangle LMN? Keep in mind, this is 45 and 46. That makes 91. Okay, so that means that angle M is 89 degrees, okay, by triangle sum theorem. Also, by what we discussed at the beginning of class, because there are three different angle values there, there are three different side measures in this triangle. So all the measures of the angles are less than 90, which makes it an acute triangle. The largest one is less than 90. 89 is helping me to uh, classify this. And then there are no sides the same. So it's acute scalene. And that's where we're at. Are there any other follow-up questions? So here's the deal. We're going to be getting today's assignment. Today's assignment, I want you not to do problems 4 and 9. And you'll be very happy that we're not doing problem 9, and you're welcome. Okay? But in the 20 minutes that remains in this class, we should be done with this assignment. I've had some people just staring ahead, doing nothing with their assignment because they're waiting for me to do the assignment the next day. Please keep in mind 
that that is not true about the test, and these are the same questions you will answer on the test. Different numbers will be put in place. No, you keep that. You keep it. Now, as far as the assignments are concerned, I will be collecting all of your assignments on Tuesday, um, the 9th of January. I will check them off and hand them back to you while you are taking a quiz. Okay? You'll take a quiz. I'll take care of your assignments. We'll get that back to you, and you'll move on with things. Okay, and then I'll be done with those. I'll put them in your grade. Life will be cool, and the only thing left will be your chapter six test before your review. So know that those things are coming down the pipe, and we got to make sure we're ready for them. Are there any other questions? Okay, cool. Get it done. <laughs>